Hey, welcome back. In my last video, I shared the first five cool things you will be able to do with a Mega 65, and I threw in a bonus. In this video, I'm gonna cover numbers six through 10, and I'm gonna throw in another bonus for a cool dozen, 10 cool things that you'll be able to do with your Mega 65. Hey, before I complete the list, I'd like to make a correction. Yes, there were errors in my previous video. I demonstrated a few games and those games were incorrectly recorded or set to NTSC mode. If you look at, or you remember part one, sprites were not properly located. They were kind of bouncing around. They were above where they should have been on the landscape. And some screens just weren't rendered properly. As viewers pointed out, these games sh were programmed for PAL and should have been recorded in the PAL video format. Let's go ahead and take a look at those and see what they should have looked like. Now that you've seen how those games should look, let's go back to my list. Before I do, please remember that there is a wonderful companion blog post that includes all 12 cool things along with all of the links you need and the additional information from developers not found in this video. Check it out using the link below or check out the link in the video description under the YouTube video. Now let's get started with items six through 10 and our bonus. Number six, load software from multiple storage devices. The Mega 65 includes a port that to my knowledge, no other modern Commodore recreation includes, and that's the serial IEEE 488 or IEC bus. This peripheral bus works with disk drives and printers, and its inclusion on the Mega 65 means we can use devices such as a 1541, 1571, 1581 disk drives, an MPS 801 printer, or even a modern SD to IEC device. Using an original disk drive will provide an authentic user experience. However, the internal floppy on the Mega 65s makes for an integrated experience similar to floppy drives found on the Commodore 128D and the Amiga 500. At the time of this writing, not all floppy disk controller features are functional. However, the Mega 65 does include something pretty interesting. When you access a .d81 file on the SD card, the mechanical drive makes sounds showing that it is accessing the SD card. These are not drive sounds replicated on the SID. No, the, the, the actual hardware, the drive within the Mega 65 is clicking and making spinning sounds. It's those little touches that make the Mega 65 so special. Currently, the Mega 65 can read from the mechanical floppy. However, full drive support is coming soon to include formatting and writing to both a double-sided double density as well as a double-sided high density floppy. The Mega 65 storage flexibility, I think, is unique among other emulators and hardware recreations. For instance, the C64 Maxi and Mini does not include a way to use original Commodore floppy drives or even an SD to IEC. They have their own format for using a USB drive. The Mega 65 provides an original Commodore experience not found in any other recreation. 
Number seven, run a Commodore 65 specific version of GEOS. In 1984, the Mac was released with its newfangled mouse and pointer user interface. Two years later, Berkeley Softworks brought its own point and click operating system to Commodore users and named it GEOS. GEOS is legendary in the Commodore community with versions for the Commodore 64, 128, and even the Commodore Plus 4. There was even a version ported to Mac's older 8-bit sibling, the Apple II. GEOS is probably famous because it should not have run on an 8-bit machine with a clock speed of 1 megahertz and less than 64 kilobytes of RAM. Later versions of the Commodore 64, namely the Commodore C64C, were available with a GEOS bundle and users could purchase a couple of models of specialized RAM expansion units to make things speedier. Commodore released the 1351 mouse and that was in response to the popularity of this whole new point and click user interface showing up in productivity software on other 8-bit computers. But my guess is GEOS is what made the mouse sales for the 1351 just grow exponentially. It's fun to imagine what GEOS could have been on the Commodore 65. However, we don't have to. Developer Falk will bring GEOS to the Mega 65, and he's been kind enough to share this early work with me. Now, there's a lot more to know about this version of GEOS, and I have a lot of additional information in the companion blog post from Falk, the developer himself, so be sure and check that out. What's exciting though is Falk is committed to getting this version of GEOS running and operational and will soon open it up so that other developers can join in. Falk told me that there are many testing and bug fixes on the way and there are a lot of features on the roadmap. So it's gonna be so much fun to once again watch the development of GEOS as it matures and we could have seen what could have been in the 1980s had GEOS continued development on a Commodore 8-bit computer. I assume that what we will see is a version of GEOS that is mature and sophisticated enough to even more rival a Mac of that same era. Number eight, manage the Mega 65 using a modern PC. Modern retro computing recreations rely on external storage devices such as USB drives and SD cards, and they do so to replace aging tape and disk drive units. Makes sense, those are getting harder to find, and when you do find one, sometimes they just don't work. The Mega 65 is no different. However, while many devices such as, again, the C64 Mini and Maxi require you to physically remove a USB drive, move it into another computer to manage the contents, the Mega 65 team provide this great software solution that allows you to manage the files on the SD card remotely when you connect your Mega 65 to a Mac, Linux, or Windows computer. The hardware connection is a simple USB cable from the Mega 65 to the host computer, and the software you use is something called M65 Connect for, again, Mac, Linux, or Windows, and it's now in version 1.6 with even more great features. It's an active development and features are added almost monthly. You connect the Mega 65 to a computer, you turn on the Mega 65, you load the M65 Connect software on the remote computer, such as your Mac, and you can access and manage your SD card, as well as some additional features, such as drag and drop a .d81 or .prj file on the M65 Connect window and it automatically loads the software on the Mega 65. You can also send files directly over such as SID files, bit streams, hiccup files, ROMs, and basic programs and they'll be sent directly from the remote computer to the Mega 65. You can create and apply ROM patches, create and send core files, view and save console text. Yes, there's a console where you can interact with your Mega 65 on your remote computer. You can reset the Mega 65 you can even change the Mega 65 to C64 mode, switch between, between PAL and NTSC mode, which I guess I should have done on that last video when I was highlighting those games. You can take a screen capture. One of my favorite features is to use the M65 to take a screen capture so that I can share either with you, the viewers, or I can sh share with developers who are trying to work out the bugs. So M65 Connect will be a vital and critical tool to your success and enjoyment using the Mega 65. Number nine, play. Commodore 64 SID files and Amiga mod files. You know, the first thing I have to do is make an admission here. I changed this number nine based on comments made on the Mega 65 Discord channel after I published the first five. Gers commented that he hoped M3WP's wonderful dot mod player, Mancha, 
would make the list. I read the comment and thought, you know, that's, that's so much better than the one I had selected. Mancha does an excellent job highlighting the four soft SID chips and four channel stereo 16-bit digital audio capabilities of the Mega 65. However, before I played the mod files, I wondered, could I also play the older SID files that were more common on the Commodore 64? And guess what? It's very easy. As we saw in the previous section, you use M65 Connect to drag a .SID file over onto the M65 Connect window, it automatically loads on the Mega 65, and you know what happens, this SID file plays. But let's go ahead and take a listen at some SID files right now. So that's pretty impressive. It'll play original Commodore C64 SID files. It should be able to do that, right? You remember earlier I said, and as a matter of fact, in my first five items, I shared that the Mega 65 has features that rival an Amiga. Playing mod files is one of those features. Let's listen to a few Mega 65 generated mod files.
Number 10, install additional cores. So the Mega 65 is built on top of a Xilinx Atrix A7200T FPGA or Field Programmable Gate Array. The beauty of an FPGA is the ability to configure the circuitry to act like other digital devices such as our favorite retro computers. While the Mega 65's primary design is to be a modern remake of the in-development Commodore 65, it includes enough space or slots so that we can install other cores. Yes, I'm going to do air quotes, for cores to configure the FPGA to replicate other computers. Current cores include the Game Boy and ZX Spectrum, or ZX Spectrum, depending on where you're from. However, we can look forward to Atari, Amiga, and other retro cores for the Mega 65. Adding cores is a simple process. You place the cores on the SD card, you boot into the Mega 65 core utility by holding the no scroll key down and turning on the power. You select a core to flash by holding down control plus the corresponding slot number one through seven. The core utility will recognize the cores available on the SD card, select the core you want, press the return key, and prepare to wait for approximately 10 to 15 minutes. Once the core is flashed and verified, you select it by hitting the return key. You can always swap the core later by returning to the core utility screen, selecting another core. Using the new cores is actually a pretty simple process. You flash the core to one of the seven available slots, as I mentioned. You configure the SD card for both the ZX Spectrum and the Game Boy. There is some configuration and some files you need to drop on the SD card. And once you do that, away you go. You are emulating one of those two devices. The Game Boy SD card instructions are pretty simple. I have those in the companion blog post. While the ZX Spectrum is a little more complicated, but nothing that you can't handle. It's basically a few more files to copy and a couple more folders to create. So some of you are out there saying, you know, why do I need a Mega 65? I can do all of this on a Mister. Well, let me just give you a little personal gripe I have about Misters. I am not a fan of these devices where you plug on a whole bunch of cores and then you have uh, this keyboard that doesn't match up with the core that's included. You gotta figure out all these key mappings. Even on the Game Boy, I had to figure out what key was start, which key was select. I went to the ZX Spectrum, I had to figure all that out. Luckily, there's a keyboard tester. But the keyboard, the hardware doesn't match the software. So I will tell you, I likely will not use these cores. I just wanted to demonstrate that it was possible here. I like the Commodore keyboard when I'm using a Commodore inspired or Commodore recreation, which is probably why I back the ZX Spectrum next too, because I want that physical hardware with a true keyboard. So I'm not trying to guess on what's mapped. So as a curiosity, it was kind of a fun experiment to play with those cores, but really beyond maybe the Game Boy, but even at that, I've got some handhelds that do the job better probably won't use these cores. Probably will reserve these for other Commodore cores to come, such as the Commodore C64 um, core that may be coming down the road. Boy, if they did a VIC-20 core, that would be kind of sweet. So I would love to fill up all my slots with retro Commodore computers. Let's take a look at the ZX Spectrum and Game Boy cores. So that concludes the top 10 cool things you will do with a Mega 65 plus a bonus. What? Oh yes, you're right. You're yelling at me. If you're not, you should be. I did promise you another bonus, didn't I? So let's talk about bonus number two. Bonus number two, make a phone call. No, I'm not talking about VoIP on the Mega 65. I'm talking about a companion device in development right now called the, you ready for this? I love this name, the Mega 
megaphone, not like this megaphone, but a megaphone. This is what, well, whichever generation you're from, as I've learned uh, this past week. First, it's a handheld Mega 65. So that's the very first thing the megaphone is. That's right. All the processing power and retro computing goodness of the Mega 65 in the palm of your hand. I do not have one. I wish I had one to show you, but I do not have one yet. However, let's talk about it. The Mega 65 inspired megaphone includes a touchscreen, on-screen keyboard, and game controllers for, of course, on-the-go gaming. So what is the megaphone? Well, here's some information I was able to scour from the website as well as some presentations by developer Paul Gardner Stevens. Second, it's a phone with a careful security design of the hardware that isolates all the untrustable parts like the cellular modem. Third, the megaphone is a mesh networking device that uses UHF packet radio. Let's say in the event of an emergency or pandemic, as we're all coming out of, the mesh networking can spring into action to allow communication and data transfer to essential workers or public service officials. Adding a solar-powered rechargeable battery will ensure the device has unlimited power for those emergencies. Oh, and you can use that same network to play games against each other. So finally and fourth, it will use a Raspberry Pi compute module to allow the installation of Android with a focus on accessibility functions and features. As the father of a special needs child, I appreciate this added focus on making the megaphone not only a fun device, but one that will help provide access for those with disabilities. Utilizing a compute module will also allow the megaphone to continue to receive hardware and Android updates for many, many years to come, unlike current phone designs. There's much more to learn about this device. Work on the Megaphone and the Mega 65 in tandem supports the development of each platform. This will be another project to follow and it's gonna be a blast to see how it develops. I reached out to Paul and asked him if he could provide some video and maybe I'll expand a little bit on this concept of the Megaphone. He immediately went to Twitch, made a recording and here's some bits and pieces from that recording. Uh, we also have a handheld version uh, that we've been working on for a little while. So uh, up across, let's hold it here in front. So this is a prototype that we built um, two or three years ago, I reckon now. Uh, you can see at the moment the, the size of the prototypes is about the size of a, uh, a Nintendo Switch. It's, obviously it's a bit thicker than that because this is what we can kind of easily make in a, a fairly affordable way. Uh, we've got a, a filthy great big 32 watt hour battery in here. So it's about the size of a typical laptop battery now, in fact. Uh, and this earlier prototype, uh, a few other weird things, we had a smart card reader because we actually realized we could probably use this as a, um, uh, a uh, like an FPOS, a uh, bank terminal, uh, point of sales. Um, VGA output. Uh, so both of those are changing on the next uh, revision. The next revision will have a digital video output. Uh, so we have a smaller connector than that. Uh, and the uh, smart card is going because there's actually going to be a bay there that can take uh, a Raspberry Pi compute module. And the, um, while we're looking at the top, so we've got a, a barrel uh, uh, power input connector. We'll hopefully change that for a USB-C on the next revision. Uh, and we've got three and a half mil audio jack because that's just sensible to have. Uh, and here is it's a little bit hard to see. Um, these are little uh, power switches. Back to the front for a moment. So we've got uh, you know, uh, D-pad type controllers and buttons. So it's kind of, it's quite nice. And again, for adult hands, you know, it's kind of uh, Nintendo Switch size. It works, uh, you know, it's quite uh, nice to use. There's these little tiny buttons down here that we had uh, that were uh, doing various functions. We're actually getting rid of those. We're just going to have uh, these larger, friendlier uh, buttons. We just buy these cheap uh, from China. There's, you know, PCB uh, contact with the, uh, uh, the carbonized rubber and then if we have a look on the bottom here, uh, we have, of course, a 9-pin joystick port. So if you don't want to use the uh, things on the top, uh, you could you know, have yourself a, uh, uh, you know, uh, a nice proper joystick, uh, and you could use that you know, to play games while you're out and about. And again, because it's got the, uh, the digital video out on the next revision as well, or the VGA out on this one, um, you could in fact actually kind of use it as a, a portable uh, Mega 65 uh, game system. Uh, on this edge, we've got 
uh, more power switches for more of the subsystems. Uh, and two of those are actually for the cellular modem base. Because again, it's also supposed to be a phone. Uh, so it's a little bit hard to see in from the edge in there, but there's actually two industry standard M.2 uh, communication space, one kind of here and one sort of in behind here. Uh, and so you can put a, uh, you know, for example, a, a 4G uh, modem uh, in there or a 5G modem in fact, so you can have a 5G Mega 65 if you want, but you can have a dual 5G Mega 65 uh, if you really want to. Just decide to work this time. Wow, look at that, it is. So you can see there, if I bring that up to the camera a little bit more, you can see it is exactly what we have. On this one, it's a little bit offset. We've, we, we know how to, uh, to recenter that uh, correctly, but it's a little itty bitty portable Mega 65. I want to thank Paul for his video. And if you want to see more, because there is a lot more about the megaphone, be sure to check out his YouTube video link is on the companion blog post as well as in the video description below. And there you have it, 12 solid cool things that you're going to do with a Mega 65 or a Megaphone whenever those are released. I hope you enjoyed this series. Don't forget if you've missed part one, go back and check out numbers one through five plus a bonus. Also be sure to read once again the companion blog post for a lot more information and all the links you need. So thanks for watching. Continue to watch the Mega 65 development along with me by subscribing, liking, and doing all that stuff down at the bottom. Be sure and leave your comments. I'm sure you have some ideas maybe for some additional cool things that I miss. I'd love to read about those. So at this time, Retro Combs out.